Last year, I had the pleasure of introducing former Secret Service agents Clint Hill and Gerald Blaine, and they, along with Lisa McCubbin, uh, wrote a book called The Kennedy Detail. As is no surprise, they shared with us the history that many of us lived through and gave us an insight into that horrible day in Dallas on Friday, November 22, 1963. I tell people that I can get a Gaithersburg connection to anyone. I knew that the person in charge of the Kennedy detail that day was a man by the name of Roy Kellerman, the Secret Service agent in charge. His family lives in Gaithersburg, and in fact, they, his brother and sister-in-law, his sister-in-law is here today with us, and uh, they still live here today, thank goodness. The book that Mr. Hill and Ms. McCubbin uh, have written, and let me just tell you about Lisa McCubbin very quickly. She's a uh, former news anchor for Bakersville, from Bakersville, California. She uh, reported in the Mideast, and she's quite accomplished, uh, as you'll be able to tell. Of course, Mr. Mr. Hill is a former Secret Service agent. The book that they've written, called Mrs. Kennedy and Me, is a work that is difficult to put down as you read it. It has great detail and, rem and reminds us of the human side of his important job, job guarding Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. After President Kennedy was shot, Wikipedia reminds us of this quote, that Hill ran from the car immediately behind the presidential limousine and leapt and leaped onto the back of it, holding on while the car raced to Parkland Memorial Hospital. This action was documented in the famous Zapruder film. Hill is the last surviving passenger of the presidential limousine which arrived at Parkland that day. Please join me in giving another great Gaithersburg welcome to Mr. Clint Hill. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be back here in Gaithersburg. I want to make sure that you have a chance to uh, be introduced to Lisa McCubbin, who's a noted author and writer and who, without her, this book would not have been written. And uh, Lisa and I today are going to uh, have somewhat of an informal conversation. She's going to ask me questions, and we're going to show you some photographs, many of which you've never seen, have never been published before. So with that, Lisa. OK, thank you so much. Can you hear? Is this one working? No. Let's see. OK. Can you hear me from this one? No. OK. Nope. See an this one. I think this is the best one. This is actually for the video. That's okay. That's probably the best. We'll just uh, play it by ear here. So let's go to the next slide. Um, Clint, um, first tell us when, why, and how did you become a Secret Service agent? I entered the Secret Service in 1958. I had previously been a special agent in counterintelligence for the counterintelligence school and I liked the work that I was doing there, and I decided to continue it, and so I joined the Secret Service in 1958. There were at that time 269 agents total in the entire organization. I was very fortunate to become one of them. And so we're showing a photograph of you, that's um, Clint in the sunglasses there on the right with President Eisenhower. Um, and then in 1960, President, or John F. Kennedy was elected president, and Okay. So which one am I supposed to speak into? Either one. Okay. Um, so uh, John F. Kennedy was elected president in 1960, and um, Clint was given the assignment to guard the first lady. Now, Clint, you weren't exactly too happy about that, though, were you? No, not at all, because I, I wanted to be a, continue on with the president, President Kennedy in this instance, because I'd really enjoyed the time with President Eisenhower. We've been all around the world through Asia, South America, and Europe, and it was extremely historic and enjoyable for me, and I knew what was going to happen if I was assigned as First Lady, because I'd seen what it was like with Mrs. Eisenhower and Mrs. Truman. It meant fashion shows and tea parties, and I wasn't too proud <laughs> about going to those things, but I had to accept the assignment, and I did. And so when you met Mrs. Kennedy, she was eight months pregnant. Um, sort of what she looks like in this photograph. And let's go to the next photograph. Um, and then two weeks after your assignment, Clint, tell us what happened. It was Thanksgiving, 1960. The president came up from Florida and spent uh, Thanksgiving with uh, Mrs. Kennedy and Caroline. Uh, he went back to Florida that evening, 
left at about 6.45 or so. And when I determined that Mrs. Kennedy was going to be in for the night, I went home. And I was home at about 10 o'clock, the phone rang. And they advised me that Mrs. Kennedy had been taken by ambulance to Georgetown Hospital. And that there was an emergency situation that she was about to give birth. We finally notified the president who was down in Florida, and he started on his way back. I went to the hospital, paced the floor like the expected father, and uh, subsequently, little John Jr. was born that night. And Mrs. Kennedy stayed in uh, the hospital for about two weeks after um, giving birth by cesarean section. She was very weak. And then in early December, they flew down to Palm Beach. Let's go ahead to the next slide. So Clint, tell us what we're seeing in this photo. This is a Joseph P. Kennedy residence in Palm Beach, right on the ocean. A seawall separating the ocean from the property. There's an expansive lawn, a swimming pool to the left-hand side with pumped in salt water, a tennis court, very nice, a very big home. On the right side, toward the front, there you see a car parked there. That's the garage. Those are our offices. So your offices were in the garage. Um, did you stay in the house with the, with the president? No, no, no. Here's where we stayed. This is Woody's Motel over in West Palm Beach. <laughs> we were given $12 a day expense money. And that was to cover our hotel room, our food, our dry cleaning, and our laundry, and any other expenses we incurred. $12 a day, and that's why we ended up at Woody's Motel. <laughs> And so then Clint stayed down there um, through Christmas and New Year's. And he left Palm Beach for Washington. The, I was called aside by my uh, supervisor and said, uh, you know, the rooms at the White House for Carolina and John have not been finished. They're not ready yet. And so President and Mrs. Kennedy have decided to leave Carolina and John down here in Florida. And they need somebody to supervise the security detail that's with them. And you've been selected. And so I was told I would remain in Florida during the period of the inauguration, and we'd be bringing the children back sometime in February. And so this is a photograph of when they arrived, um, several weeks after the inauguration. Um, they found a, a snowman on the White House lawn. And let's go to the next slide. And this is the first photograph of the first family entering the White House as a family in 1961, and Clint, of course, was there. Now, having been with Mrs. Kennedy and um, the children down in Palm Beach for all that time, Clint thought that he was going to now be in Washington, he was gonna be able to stay at home for a bit, but um, Mrs. Kennedy had other ideas. Yes, Mrs. Kennedy came to me and said, you know what, Mr. Hill, she said, uh, we've leased some property out in Middleburg, Virginia, because we wanna have a place where we can go on weekends and I tried to convince her that Camp David was uh, available, but she wanted to go someplace where she could ride horses and be among friends in the hunt country. And so they rented a four acre farm called Glenora. Now Glenora was quite a beautiful place. It had a nice big home in the, up in the woods, the background, and it had a recreation hall there with a swimming pool, a big expansive lawn where we could land the helicopters because the president came out every Friday afternoon or Saturday morning and then there's the stables over on the side where the horses were kept. And that's where our offices were on the second floor, though, fortunately. <laughs> you were put in your place early on, right? And so let's go to the next slide. Um, along with Middleburg, um, Clint spent a lot of time in Hyannisport up at the Kennedy compound. Clint, tell us what it was like hanging out with the Kennedys at the Kennedy compound. Oh, this is Ambassador Joseph Kennedy's home up in Hyannisport, Massachusetts. It was in the, what was called the Kennedy Compound, which consisted of four homes. This particular home, a home belonging to Eunice and Sergeant Shriver, a home belonging to Attorney General Robert Kennedy, his family, and a, a home belonging to President and Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, young Teddy Kennedy had a home, but it was on Squaw Island, about uh, three quarters of a mile away from this location. And the President would come up uh, usually every uh, Friday afternoon or so, the usual routine was for the family to spend uh, Fourth of July, Labor Day, and Thanksgiving in Hyannisport. We would spend Christmas, New Year's, and Easter down in Palm Beach, but the President would come up every Friday afternoon by helicopter. 
we would preposition a golf cart there to meet him as he arrived there by helicopter. He would arrive, he would arrive at Otis by Air Force One, transfer to a helicopter, fly over to the Kennedy compound, arrive there, we'd put a golf cart out there for him, he'd come off the helicopter, get in the golf cart, and he'd scream out, anybody for ice cream? And all of his nieces and nephews and children would come running, jump on the golf cart, and away they'd go to the local ice cream store, which was about two blocks away, and he had to foot the bill. And as most people know, the Kennedys also loved being on the water. This is a photograph of President and Mrs. Kennedy on one of the yachts, um, President or Ambassador Kennedy's yacht, the Marlin. And um, so Clint and the other agents were there to protect them. They were around on jet boats. And if we go to the next slide, um, they, were, they would mostly stay on the boats, transferring dogs and kids and people back and forth, keeping an eye on things. But often they ended up, or a few times I would say, they ended up in the water. And Clint's going to tell us a story about this photo now. On this occasion, the president wanted to go sailing, so he was sailing on his favorite little sailboat with his friend Chuck Spaulding. They were talking at very close to shore, didn't, real, didn't pay attention to what they were doing. They got stuck. And I was on a jet boat near there, and he screamed over to me, hey, Clint, can you help us? We have a problem over here. So I said, yes, sir, and I jumped out of the boat. As you notice, the water is very shallow. I went over to the boat, and I said, uh, let me go underneath and see what's going on here, Mr. President. I went underneath, discovered that he was lodged in between two big rocks. So I told him, I said, uh, you better sit down. I'm going to try and rock the boat out of here. They said, okay. So I got underneath the boat with my back and had my legs up on a cone-shaped rock. And I started to go up and down with my back and push. Finally, one big lunge up and the boat took off and I went right down on top of the rock. Uh, it was cone-shaped. Uh, they sailed away. I came up out of the water in pain. They were waving and thanking me. I waded over to the jet boat. Blood was running down my legs. Fortunately, there was no permanent damage. <laughs> and um, tell us about the inscription on the photo, Clint. Well, unfortunately, there was a White House photographer there who caught all this stuff. <laughs> and so about three days later, I found on my desk a photograph of me in the water near the boat. And it had been inscribed, Clint Hill, the Secret Service are prepared for all hazards, John F. Kennedy. So then early in 1961, the President and Mrs. Kennedy um, embarked on a series of foreign trips, the first of which was um, a, a highly publicized trip to Paris and Vienna. And Clint, as the advance agent, or as Mrs. one of Mrs. Kennedy's two agents, went on the advance for that trip. Um, this is a photograph of Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. de Gaulle. You can see Clint peering behind them. He was always within arm's length of her. And let's go to the next slide. Following. Uh, this is a photograph of Mrs. Kennedy with Mrs. de Gaulle, or M President de Gaulle, sorry. And um, they had quite a reception. Clint, tell us what it was like um, to have President and Mrs. Kennedy there in Paris and what the reception was like. Well, the French government was very anxious to receive President Mrs. Kennedy, she being of French descent. She spoke fluent French. And so they went all out to do everything they could to make it a great reception. From the numbers of people and the amount of equipment used, they also they took a brand new automobile, a Citroen, cut the metal top off, built a plastic top for it so she could be seen as she traveled around Paris. Uh, she, one of the big events was a dinner at Versailles. And she had the attention of President de Gaulle, who was not usually the type of person who was very friendly or conversed with very many people. But she happened to get his ear. And on one occasion, he turned to her and said, oh, Mrs. Kennedy, you know, I wish the French people knew as much history about France as you do. <laughs> and then he and she conversed, and she convinced him that it would be very nice if they would allow the Mona Lisa to leave France and come to the United States for people to view it. And he did. And following this trip to Paris and Vienna, Mrs. Kennedy went on her first foreign trip alone as First Lady to Greece. And this is a photograph. You can probably pick out Clint. Um, in the sunglasses there on the side. Prior to leaving on this trip to Paris and Vienna, President Kennedy called Clint into the Oval Office and gave him some instructions. Yes, it was rather unusual. I got a call saying the President wanted to see me, so I went to the Oval Office. And he was there with his brother, the Attorney General. 
And he said, Clint, he said, I understand you're going to Greece to do the advance for Mrs. Kennedy when she arrives there? I said, yes, Mr. President. He said, one thing he said I want you to do when you get to Greece, make sure that Mrs. Kennedy never crosses paths with Aristotle Onassis. I said, yes, sir, I'd be glad to do that. And I went back to my office because I didn't know why. I really didn't know the history of anything. And then I found out that Aristotle Onassis was in legal trouble with the United States. He had been fined $7 million. And they did not want, for political reasons, a photograph to appear of Mrs. Kennedy and Aristotle Onassis. They knew that it would be detrimental to their fut political future. And on that trip, Clint was successful. She did not cross paths with Aristotle Onassis in 1961. Um, another highly publicized trip came in 1962 when Mrs. Kennedy decided to visit India and Pakistan. She was the first American First Lady to have ever visited either of these two countries. And it was a huge undertaking. Once again, Clint went as the advance agent to make all the preparations for her trip there. Um, tell us a little bit about what that was like, Clint, and uh, before you went on to Pakistan. I was selected to go and do the advance for Pakistan and India, and they asked me to select some people to go with me, and I picked a team of 14 agents to go along because we were going to a number of cities, and I knew about half of them would get sick, and so I had to have at least two guys for each city to make sure everything was okay. I also had a communications people with me. I had a Colonel Gordon Parks from White House Communications Agency. His daughters happen to be here in the audience today. Colonel Parks kept me in contact with the White House, which was extremely essential because I was dealing with Ambassador Ken Galbraith in India, who was a very persuasive and powerful man, and I needed all the backing I could get from the highest authority in the country, and that being the President. And this is a photograph of Mrs. Kennedy with Ken Galbraith there on the left. You can pick out Clint on the right-hand side. Um, Clint, tell us about this photograph. Well, Mrs. Kennedy loved to ride horses and was an accomplished horsewoman. And the presidential guard there in New Delhi had a large mounted contingent and a great big parade grounds and parade field where they trained. And so I arranged for her to go there and ride. And you can see on her face how happy she was. It just made everything really uh, come to a f the forefront that she was really excited about being able to ride there in India. She loved to ride horses. And that was the one, of, one of the things that, um, the reasons why Mrs. Kennedy and Clint had such a close connection was he allowed her to do the things she wanted to do. Um, other Secret Service agents would try to keep her from doing things or tell her, no, that's not a good idea. And Clint's attitude was always, look, if you want to do it, it's our job to make it a safe environment for you to do that. And she really appreciated that. Now we're going to show you a video in just a moment. Um, Clint's going to first explain what's going on here and then we'll play the video. This is taking place in Pakistan. Well, when she came to Pakistan, she came to Lahore, which is near the Indian border, and they were having the International Horse Show in Lahore at the time. President Ayub Khan loved horses, she loved horses, and so we went there and she rode in a carriage with President Ayub Khan into the uh, horse show grounds. There were thousands of people there to receive her. They were led by his mounted unit, and you'll see what happened as we proceeded through this ceremony. She is about to be presented with a gift from President Ayub Khan and the people of Pakistan, a beautiful horse. I really admired the look on her face. She was so happy, but I had a problem. How am I going to get that damn horse back to the Washington? 
can see she really loved that horse, and there was no way that horse was going to stay in Pakistan. So that was Clint's one of Clint's other jobs to get the horse back to Pakistan, which he did. Now, another place they visited in Pakistan was the Khyber Pass. And we're going to show you another video here of what that was like. And remember, this is 1962. This is a Muslim country. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy is there being greeted. She's a first lady. The president is not with her. This is extremely unusual, the number of people that came out to greet her. There were large crowds everywhere we went. And in Muslim country like Pakistan, most of them were male. But it was very unusual for a female to, to get the attention and the reception that she was getting. So we were going from Peshawar up to the Khyber Pass. So it was a roadway. We had to drive up there. And we got up there. to Khyber Pass is the separation point between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And it's up in the Hindu Kush Mountains. And we could look over into, into Afghanistan from there. On the way up, we had to drive through what was called the tribal area. And my advance agent came to me and said, Clint said, we got a problem. The tribal chieftains want you to stop. They're going to make a presentation to Mrs. Kennedy. I said, that's no problem. What's, what's wrong? He said, well, they're going to give her a dagger. <laughs> and then they're going to present her with a lamp. And I said, no, no, we, we've got enough animals. We don't need any more animals. He, he said, no, no, you don't understand. They're not going to let her take the lamb with her. They're going to sacrifice the lamb. I said, not in her presence, they're not. I said, you tell them that they can take the lamb out behind the tent. And when they do that, I'm putting her in the car, and we're going up to the Khyber Pass. And so that's what we did. I could drove away. I could hear the bleat of that poor little sheep as it met its demise. And notice the cap that Mrs. Kennedy is wearing. It's called a caracal cap. Um, the president of Pakistan, Ayub Khan, had been wearing that cap earlier, and she commented on it and really liked it. And so he took it off his head, placed it on hers, and she wore it with her Chanel suit up to the Khyber Pass. <laughs> and this is a photograph of her with the dagger and the lamb <laughs> wearing the caracal cap. What the heck she was going to do with a dagger. But and now we're going to show you one more video in Pakistan. Um, on the last day they were there, they met with a camel driver named Bashir. Clint's going to give us a little bit of background, and then we'll play the video for you. Bashir was a camel driver. And the year before, Vice President Johnson was in Pakistan. He was driving down the streets of Karachi in a motorcade, and he saw this guy driving his camel down the street, and he made the motorcade stop. He jumped out. He wanted to meet the camel driver, which he did, and then he invited him to come to the United States, never thinking he'd accept. Well, he accepted. And he became a VIP in Pakistan. So when we took Mrs. Kennedy in Pakistan, it was mandatory for her to meet the camel driver. <laughs> so when we got down to Karachi, we arranged for Bashir to bring his camel and his family to a point, and we would put the two of them together. Now, Bashir had instructions as to what he could and could not do. The camel was to be there. They would, he could have the camel sit down. They could pet it and touch it. But Mrs. Kennedy and her sister Lee decided they wanted to get on the camel. <laughs> but that wasn't enough for Mrs. Kennedy. She asked to have control of the reins <laughs> and to have the camel stand up. So once she got a hold of the reins, she decided, what the heck? I'm a horse, horsewoman. She hit the camel in the rump with the reins. She wanted the camel to move. Bashir is hanging on the lead line for dear life because <laughs> if he knew if anything went wrong, that was his last day on earth. So they got the camel to walk around. They never allowed it to run, fortunately. They finally brought it back, and it all got down to the ground, and you'll see the expression on her face. She has really had a good time. 
They weren't exactly properly attired for this either. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the kind of thing Mrs. Kennedy was very spontaneous and Clint just had to adjust to what she wanted to do and allow her, if she wanted to ride the camel, she was gonna ride the camel. And this is a photograph of them departing Pakistan. Notice all the people that came out to bid her farewell, thousands of people at the Pakistan airport and that's Clint in the middle there. Yes, that was an extremely large crowd, very unusual for a, a female visiting a Muslim country to have that kind of a reception. And we were flying from Karachi to Tehran and from Tehran over to London and then back to the United States. And then after the trip to Italy and Pakistan, Mrs. Kennedy wanted to go to, or sorry, from India and Pakistan, Mrs. Kennedy decided to go to Italy that summer for a three-week vacation. Once again, Clint went along, and I'm being told we're running out of time, so we're gonna kind of have to fl fly through this a little bit. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, that's Clint with Mrs. Kennedy in Ravello, Italy. And uh, this is my f one of my favorite photographs from the book, which I discovered in one of Clint's photo albums. And I really want him to tell you the story, so we're going to tell this story. Mrs. Kenny wanted to go to a place called Pestum, which is where there were ruins for temples and things. And so we went in a yacht that called the Anietta, owned by Johnny and Yelly from Fiat, over toward Pestum. Then we had to get in a rowboat to go ashore. She went through the Temple ruins and came back, get on the rowboat to go over to the yacht. It was Mrs. Kennedy and her sister Lee and one other female, the oarsman and myself. And we were surrounded by paparazzi. The boat was about to sink. And I'm screaming at the paparazzi to help us, to move it. She's laughing at me, knowing I'm having a problem. She thinks this is really funny. I think she really th hoped we would sink <laughs> just to see what I would do. But fortunately, we managed to get back to the yacht. <laughs> okay, we're gonna run through some of these photographs and um, get to Dallas in 1963. Let's just um, go through these. You'll hear, you can read about all of these stories in the book, Mrs. Kennedy and Me. This was a 50 mile hike that Clint um, got the opportunity to take. <laughs> An award given to him by President Kennedy. Um, Mrs. Kennedy, as you may or may not know, was pregnant in 1963. Um, sadly, she lost the baby. Um, this is a photograph of Clint with President Kennedy, Caroline and John, after the loss of baby Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, um, the president going to Otis Air Force Base to visit Mrs. Kennedy. And in 19, then after the loss of Patrick, um, Mrs. Kennedy was very depressed and her sister Lee came up with an idea of something she thought would uh, help to revive her spirits. Lee had a friend in Greece who had this big yacht. Clint, just tell us briefly about this yacht. It was a very nice yacht, 325 feet long, had an enormous crew, had its own seaplane, helicopter, swimming pool on board, push a button, the floor came up, made a dance floor. It had everything you ever wanted. It was owned by Aristotle Onassis. And we went on a cruise of the Greek islands up into Turkey and came back out. But uh, it was just a wonderful time for her to recoup. And she did, her spirits did become rejuvenated. And by the time we got back is when she came to me and said that she was going to accompany the president on his trip into Texas. The trip to Texas was conceived by President Kennedy and Vice President Johnson in the spring of 1963 when they met in El Paso. They decided they needed to carry two big states in the South in order to get reelected, two states that had a lot of electoral votes, that would be Florida and Texas. And so President Kennedy went into Florida that previous Monday, did uh, Palm Beach, Cape Canaveral, Tampa, and Miami, came back to Washington. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy, Joined him on Thursday. We left the White House to fly to San Antonio. Did a speech at San Antonio, flew over to Houston, did two speeches in Houston, flew on over to Fort Worth to stay overnight, got in there very late at night, got up bright and early the next morning. He, he had a eight o'clock uh, speech to give outside the hotel. It was raining outside in Fort Worth at the time. And so he came out to make that speech. 
Then he was to win the hotel for a breakfast. Mrs. Kennedy was in her suite. I went to the suite when he went outside to stand by for her. We weren't intending to go to the breakfast. She said that she wasn't going to go, but I got a phone call. It was an agent downstairs. The president wanted me to bring her down right then to go to the breakfast, so I did. Took her downstairs to the breakfast. We then flew on over to, after the breakfast, on over to Love Field in Dallas. This will show you their arrival at Love Field in Dallas. They're getting off the rear of Air Force One, being met by Vice President Mrs. Johnson, Governor and Mrs. Connolly, Mayor Cabal and his wife from Dallas. She's presented with some flowers. And there were about 5,000 people there surrounding the exterior of the airport against the fence. He decided to go shake their hands. She normally wouldn't have done that, but because she wanted to support him in his 64 election bid, she went right on with him over and shook hands with all these people along the fence line. We then got him into the cars to take him into downtown Dallas. It wasn't a very long drive. It's a very enthusiastic reception they, they received. People were very friendly. This is as we're starting into downtown Dallas, is going through the suburbs. As we proceeded down toward Main Street, the crowd started to build. By the time we got to Main Street, they were in the street. There were so many people, the sidewalks couldn't contain them. <coughs> there were high-rise buildings. Many of the windows were open on those buildings. But you have to remember, in 1963, central air conditioning was not a matter of fact. A lot of buildings didn't have it, and so they had windows open. People were also out on balconies, on rooftops, yelling and screaming, jockey, and welcome, Mr. President, and things of that nature. But it was very friendly and receptive. Now, the driver kept the car farther to the left and to the right, trying to keep the president away from the crowd on the right-hand side. That put Mrs. Kennedy up against the crowd. I would occasionally get up on top of the car in the back to be in close proximity to her. As we proceeded down Main Street, we had to turn right on Elm. Then we turned left on, or right on Houston. Then we turned left on Elm. And that was a very sharp turn as we turned left on Elm. We couldn't go straight down Main Street because there was a barricade at the end that prevented us from going right on Stemmons Freeway, which would take us to our destination, the trademark in Dallas. That was where the speech was to be given at noon. As we proceeded down Elm Street, we got down about 80 to 100 feet from the intersection. I was on the left rear of the left running board of the follow-up car immediately behind the presidential car. I was scanning to the left to a gra grassy area, and there were some people there, not many. I heard an explosive noise over my right shoulder. It came from the right rear of the motorcade. I took my scan, then took me back across the presidential vehicle, and as I got to the point of seeing the presidential vehicle, I saw the president grab at his throat and go to his left. I knew he was in trouble, something was wrong. So I jumped and started to run, my intention being to get up on top of the back of the presidential car to form a shield so that no harm could come to President and Mrs. Kennedy. While I was running, there was a second shot. I didn't even hear it. Just before I got to the car, the driver started to accelerate. A third shot rang out. It hit the President in the head. It was a very, very damaging wound. It was so explosive that material came out of the wound, blood, brain matter, bone fragments, came over me and the car. When that happened, I was trying to get up on the car, and Mrs. Kennedy came out on the trunk. She was trying to reach some of the material that came off the president's head to grab it. It came off to the right rear. I grabbed her and put her back in her seat. When I did that, the president's body fell over to its left to, and into her lap. His right side of his face was up. I could see his eyes were fixed. There was a gaping hole in the upper right rear of his head. I could see into his skull. Portions of the brain were missing. I turned around and gave a thumbs down to the follow-up car crew. Mrs. Kennedy screamed out, oh, they've shot his head off. Jack, Jack, what have they done? And then I, uh, the lead car driver was Chief of Police Curry from Dallas. We screamed at him to get us to a hospital, and he got in front of us and led us to Parkland Hospital there in Dallas. As you can see, I'm up on the back of the car. We were going roughly 80 miles an hour. My sunglasses blew off. I wedged myself in there so that I wouldn't fall. 
And this is shortly after when we got to Parkland Hospital, a large crowd formed there uh, trying to find out what was happening. Uh, when we got to Parkland, the we had to remove Governor Connolly from the car before we could move President Kennedy because he was sitting in a jump seat right in front of him. Governor Connolly had also been shot. So we finally got the governor up, and when we finally did get to President Kennedy, Mrs. Kennedy wouldn't let go of him. And I pleaded with her, but she just wouldn't let go, and I realized what it was wrong was she didn't want anybody to see the condition he was in because it was very bad. And so I took off my coat, I laid it over his head and his upper back, and when I did that, she let go, and we lifted him up, and we raced into the emergency room there at Parkland. The doctors did everything they could trying to revive him to no avail, and at one o'clock, they declared him dead. This is a picture of us carrying the casket up to the rear of Air Force One. And this you recognize as young John saluting his father. This was at, as the casket was taken out of St. Matthew's Cathedral and placed on the casket there outside. And Mrs. Kennedy leaned down and said, salute your father, John, and he did. We had taught him how to salute previously because the president wanted or was going to go to National Cemetery on November 11th, and Mrs. Kennedy wanted him there to be able to salute with the rest of the military people. He loved military people. So what happened was, in Dallas, there were three shots that rang out in Dealey Plaza. Subsequently, the world stopped for four days, and we call that the end of the age of innocence, and you can read all about that in the book, Mrs. Kennedy and Me.